Hi, I'm Dr. Paul Morrissey, President of Campion College, and welcome to another episode of Theology Thursdays. In today's episode, we're going to be looking at the Bible, how to read the Bible. And I want to do that in four steps. The first step is looking at the incarnational principle. The second thing I want to do is look at reading the Bible as a whole. The third is the four senses of Scripture. Those are the, the four ways in which we can interpret the Bible. And the final thing I want to look at is living the Word of God. So there's a lot to get through. Let's go. The first thing is the incarnational principle. What does this mean? Well, the incarnation is usually associated, as you're probably aware, with the fact that the second person of the Trinity, the Son of God, became incarnate for us, enfleshed, incarnate, enfleshed for us. So the word became flesh, as John's gospel tells us. So the second person of the Trinity, God, became one of us, a human. We can look at the same way with the Bible, that the word of God, which is divine, God's word is divine, becomes incarnate in actual words on the page. They become human words, human concepts. So what we mean by the incarnational principle then is that there is a divine and human element to the Bible, to scripture. And this is crucial. It helps us to avoid two pitfalls with the Bible. The first pitfall is to purely see the Bible as divine which means that we can think that the Bible sort of just fell out of the sky and landed in our laps, the literal word of God. And this can result in certain sort of fundamentalist readings of the Bible, taking the Bible too literally. And that is a problem because there's lots of seeming contradictions within the word of God. So that's one pitfall we want to avoid. The other pitfall is the opposite, namely to avoid any divine aspect of the Word of God and purely see the Bible as some nice human words that we can take seriously or not. And that tends to be a more modernistic interpretation of the Bible. Fundamentalism versus modernism. The incarnational principle helps us avoid those two pitfalls. That the Bible is the Word of God, it is divine, but relayed through true human authors human authors that use their own minds, their own words, to relay this word of God into um, understandable terms for the human mind. So this is really important to, to keep in mind. So that's the first thing I wanted to say. The second thing is that it's really important that when we come to the Bible, we see the Bible as a whole. So obviously the Bible is made up a whole series of books. So it is one book, we put them all together, but it really is a whole series of books, different genres, different times, different purposes for each book. So there is a temptation to separate the Bible into these different books and not have them talking to each other. But a real Christian way of reading the Bible is to see the whole Bible as one. And in that way, we can understand better the New Testament, obviously, by understanding the Old Testament, that Christ himself does not just appear on the page in the New Testament without any background or context. The Old Testament is the context for understanding who Jesus is in the New Testament. Reading the Bible as a whole is crucial to understanding the real meaning of the revelation held within this Word of God, the Bible. So that's the second thing. So we have the incarnational principle, namely that the Bible is divine and human, and that we need to read the Bible as a whole, not to separate into different books. Now I want to look at the Bible in terms of how we, in a sense, read it and understand it, both as a church, so in a living community, but also as individuals when we come to read the Bible ourselves. So from ancient times, really with the fathers of the church and also through the medieval period, there was developed a way of reading the Bible, which we call the four senses of scripture. And this is a really helpful thing to understand when we come to reading the Bible, because it helps us see that the Bible works on different levels. 
So I'm going to take you very quickly through these four senses. So the first of these four senses is what we call the literal sense. What does this mean? Well, the literal sense particularly looks at the human dimension of the scriptures. So I said before, when I looked at the incarnational principle, that the Bible is both divine and human, just as Jesus is divine and human. So when we look at the literal, we're particularly looking at the human authors of the Bible, the true human authors, flesh and blood authors, human like you and I. And so we attempt when we're trying to understand what the Bible is saying, we, tr we try to understand who was the human author. You know, why was the human author writing this at this particular time? What was the actual context of the writing that he, was, that he was doing. What was the context of, you know, God intervening in that period in particular? Even things like, you know, what language was used? Um, what was the um, cultural context of the human author? All these things help us understand the literal sense of Scripture. So that's the first sense, or the first way we understand the Bible. And it's really important because it helps us avoid, what I said before, that fundamentalism. It helps us see that the Bible, you know, really is both human and divine, focusing on the human. Now, the other three senses of Scripture focus more on the fact that the Bible is the divine Word of God, looking more at the divine source, namely God himself. So let's unpack these other three. The first is what's called traditionally the allegorical sense of Scripture, namely that Scripture is allegory. What does this mean? Well, it means that there are allusions within the literal sense of Scripture to things beyond what that human author is saying. So to give you a quick example of that. So the author, for example, of Exodus, you know, traditionally seen as Moses himself, the author of Exodus speaks about, you know, the great exodus of the Israelites out of Egypt into the Promised Land. Now, we can read this text as Christians, allegorically, and we do this particularly at Easter time, because the great exodus of Israel to Egypt is an allegory of the Christian's journey from slavery to freedom. And that Moses in the Old Testament is like Christ in the New Testament. And when he parts that Red Sea, Christ does the same for us. Again, allegorically, we can see this in the Old Testament, Christ does the same for us in baptism. The baptism represents that Red Sea for us. And that's why it's a crucial text, for example, read it at, during Easter, that the Easter celebration is really Christ parting the Red Sea for us. So we can read Exodus allegorically. In fact, we have to read it allegorically as Christians through the lens of faith. So the allegorical sense is really reading the Bible through the lens of faith in Christ, particularly the Old Testament. So that's the allegorical. The other two are to do with um, the moral sense of Scripture. So what does the Scripture teach us, particularly personally, in terms of what I should do? You know, what I should do morally speaking. So Scripture is obviously full of moral precepts or um, moral commands. So the Bible can teach us how to live a good life. And so the moral sense of Scripture is really about that, that as a Christian we can take Scripture and say, wow, you know, God is speaking to me through this word in terms of my own situation and helping me understand how I can live a good life. That's the moral sense. And traditionally that was called the tropological sense. That's a technical word. And the third of these spiritual senses, or the fourth of the, the four senses of scriptures, is, the, is to do with hope, and traditionally called the anagogical sense of scripture. So, scripture is a word of hope. And really, scripture teaches us and can teach us when we read it and pray with it, it can give us hope. Because really, scripture is about salvation history, right from the beginning of our own creation. You know, when we, when we look at the creation account, the second creation account, together with the first, we see that we're created good. 
we see that we're created for something great. And that gives us hope. At the end of the Bible, the Bible ends with, you know, come Lord Jesus, which is a great exclamation of hope. The Bible is full of hope if we allow ourselves to be touched by that hope. So quickly to recap, these four senses, the literal, to do particularly with the human sense of Scripture, the human authors, and then those three spiritual senses of Scripture to do with the divine source, are to do really with those three theological virtues. Faith, allegorical, um, love, the moral, and hope itself. Faith, hope and love. And it's a really helpful way to understanding you know, how to interpret and read the Bible. Now the last thing I want to do is speak about really how we can live the Word of God. To live the Word of God. And the first thing I want to say about this is that sometimes we make the mistake and we can make the mistake of saying that Christianity is a religion of the book. Christianity is a religion of the book. Now, why do I say that's a mistake? Because Christianity does have a book and, and this is it, you know, the, the Holy Bible. It does have this book. But it's a mistake because really Christianity is a religion of the word, the logos. Because Christianity, a Christian is one who follows the word, the logos, namely the second person of the Blessed Trinity, the word made flesh. So that's the first thing to say. How do we live the word? Well, we live the word by allowing ourselves to be transformed by Christ. Now, one of the ways we can understand this word and therefore be able to live it is through this particular incarnation of that word, namely sacred scripture. That is by understanding and trying to live this particular word. Now, how do we do that? Well, just to give a quick I guess, personal testimony for myself. I used to think that the Bible was something, you know, that was just simply for the liturgy and didn't really touch directly my sort of daily life. But over time, I began to see, well, that's, that's a false understanding. You know, sacred scripture, the word of God is something alive and active. And, you know, as it says in sacred scripture, is a sword, it can really pierce our hearts. It can really, really cut to the very marrow of our bones if we allow it. Because God, from all eternity, wants to speak to the here and now in my life through this word. And, and do I believe it? You know, St. Augustine himself had this encounter when he was you know, going through his period of conversion. He heard a voice saying, Tolo leisure, take up and read. And he opened the scriptures. He just opened them up. Take it up. Okay, take it up and read. And he opened to Romans. And here was a text given specifically for him at this moment in his life, which helped his conversion. Now, why don't we do that ourselves? Why don't we allow that word to touch us? So we may be at the liturgy, the sacred liturgy. Are we really expecting the Lord to pierce our heart with his word or we may have a big decision that we we need to make or we we're going through a little difficulty why don't we just take that bible and you know take it up and read just like augustine did because the lord wants to speak to us through his word if we let him so we need to be able to live it and one last point on on living the word of god you know the lord speaks and he speaks to us all the time through various ways and one of the ways is certainly through sacred scripture. But, you know, a dialogue is, is two-way. So we need to not only, in a sense, hear that word, but we need to receive it. What does that mean? Well, it means, and the, and the fathers of the church teach us about this as well, it means that we allow this word to enter our life by, by chewing on it, by chewing on it, by mulling over it. And so you, you need to, to mull over, to read over, to knead the word and then ultimately by kneading it and, and really bring it together to create the bread, you, you put it in the oven and it bears that, you know, that smell and the richness of the, of the loaf of bread in your life. 
And it, it's a bit of that. The Lord may give us a word, may give us a word, and what we do, need to do, we don't just sort of forget about it the next day, but we should write it down. You know, write it down. Make it flesh, if you like, in our life by writing it down and then taking it to prayer and really asking, well, what do you mean by this, Lord? You know, how do you want me to live it? And the Lord will help us. He'll help us to really live it by making a little decision or trying to make it, again, incarnate in our life. The Word becomes flesh in our life if we allow Him to do it. So, just to quickly recap, the incarnational principle, the divine and the human helping us to avoid fundamentalism and, and modernism, the fact that we need to read the Bible as a whole, all the New Testament, all the books together, interpreting each other. The four senses of Scripture to really help us understand the sacred Scriptures. And finally, really trying to live the Word, allow the Lord to really become incarnate with our own very lives. So I hope you enjoyed this very brief introduction to reading the Bible. Um, just a couple of things before we sign off. First is, if you've got any questions or comments, please... Uh, put them in the, in the section below, any feedback, whatever it is, please put them in the comments section and we'll endeavour to, to, to answer some of those questions. Here at Camping College, we study theology and as well as that, we give context to theology through all the different core units that we study. If you want to find out more about our programs here at Campion, particularly our liberal arts degree, please visit our website. Until next time, thanks for joining us. I mean, that's, a, that's an excellent question. And in a sense, it's a very personal question. I mean, there are reading guides that you can, you can certainly find online for the Bible and reading plans, and, and that can be great. But, I, you know, I'm happy to give my own sort of personal view on that. I think um, it's good to start, you know, as a Christian, good to start with, with the New Testament and the, and the Gospels and to choose one of the Gospels. Um, you know, my recommendation would be Mark. Mark, so, you know, I, I, you know they're all wonderful Gospels. <laughs> but Mark's Gospel is... It's to the point. Um, but also, you know, one thing I love about Mark, he has these little flourishes too. He likes to describe things that the other evangelists perhaps don't describe. So it, it sort of brings, you know, Mark really brings the, the New Testament alive. And um, so I really recommend that. But, you know, one of the Gospels. And then interchange sort of New Testament with the Old Testament. So once you've read uh, one of the Gospels to, to go to the Old Testament and, and probably either Genesis or Exodus, maybe start with Genesis. That's a big book, but uh, you know, really, there you've got salvation history being being uh, laid out for us. Um, so to alternate, you know, you've read the Gospel of Mark, and then you think, wow, you know, Genesis. How does it relate to the New Testament? And and that can be really helpful, particularly you know, in terms of reading the Bible as a whole, all the New Testaments together. Um, and then you know, shift around genres as well. So maybe the next book of the New Testament, you might. Uh, read one of Paul's letters, maybe Romans to start with, the most really theological book of the New Testament. And then go back to the, to the old, maybe go back to Exodus if you've read Genesis first or one of the Old Testament prophets, um, alternating Old New Testament. And then, you know, the wisdom literature too could be, you know, the Psalms. Maybe, maybe in your prayer time you can just start reading the Psalms anyway, um, either through the Liturgy of the Hours or, or so on, you know, and so, so, so rich. But I suppose the simplest way, really, of, of reading the Bible is, is follow the, the, the church's, church's calendar. Um, also, the Office of Readings in the, in the, um, in the Liturgy of the Hours is a, is a helpful way as well. There's, there's lots of ways, but that's, that would be my recommendation. Yeah, so Lexio Divina, you know, divine reading of the, of the text. Um, perhaps I alluded to it when I was talking about, you know, living the Word of God. So Lexio Divina is... is, is as it says, a divine reading. So it's really trying to attune ourselves to those three spiritual senses of Scripture, you know, faith, hope and love. So you, you take, you know, you might take one of the, you know, the prophets from the Old Testament. But I think Lexio Divini, you should be more guided really by the Holy Spirit and really ask the Lord, you know, what do you want me to pray with at the moment? Um, that can be very helpful. But if, if there's no sort of, you know, blazing light there, 
you know, maybe just start with, say, Isaiah um, and, and read through Isaiah prayerfully. So the idea of Lexio Divina is that we, we really just, you know, we start with the sign of the cross, a moment of quiet, and really ask the Holy Spirit to speak to us through the word. And then we just start reading. And if, if we stop or if we just feel, wow, that's an interesting point, we stop there and we just pray with it. And we let that word sink in. Let that word sort of, you know, really, really um, enter our soul and to pray with that particular word. And you might just stay with that, that one verse for a long time. That's what we mean by that, you know, really trying to hear the Lord speaking to us through those, you know, faith, hope and love senses of Scripture.